put a workout. <laughs> Little Pac-Man lid. Hi, YouTube friends. If you've been following my YouTube shorts and my posts, you would have seen that about a month ago, I got the Weber key. I have been sort of teasing this, if you will, on my channel for a while. It was supposed to arrive in the fall, COVID, little production, you know, life. But now it's here. It arrived around January. I believe I'm one of the early people to have gotten it too. And I'd like to go over all of this. Weber Workshops is for sure a company that you've heard before in the coffee world. I have their grinders as well, the Moulin grinders, which you can see the review on my channel. I backed this on Indiegogo and it's available for pre-order as well. So I got the Indiegogo price. So it's been just about a year that I've been into espresso right now. I started with a Sete 270 and made a huge jump to the key, which was kind of a impulse buy. I was looking at the niche for the longest time, but I thought the niche is too expensive. I don't need that. <laughs> this is a lot more expensive than the niche, but I got it. So the question is, would an intermediate coffee person such as myself benefit from this $2,000 USD grinder? That's kind of the angle I'm coming from. I'm going to be talking a lot about user experience compared to a lot of the other reviews you might have already have seen just because I'm comfortable with speaking with that. But I have noticed some differences in taste and stuff like that, which I will get into. But let's find out. I'm going to cover it all. I'm gonna go really in depth. Why did I decide to upgrade from the Sete 270? Sete 270 is a great grinder at its price point. When you do a lot of research, you'll notice that that's pretty much the best value for money intro grinder that you can get once you're starting the solo espresso journey. It served me well, I learned a lot on it and it made really great coffee. But I definitely did have a little bit of the upgrade Titus. I wanted something that was a little bit more consistent in terms of the numbers. The Sete 270, the lines and where they align, it's not that great. And even writing the company, they just told me like, oh yeah, it's normal, it happens. Just like know where, you're, where you are in your grind setting. Sometimes the line would kind of be in between two. So it'd be a little bit difficult to follow. It would drift a little bit too, which could be fixed with some spacers that they provide. The customer service was excellent for that. You know, there was a lot of plastic on it. It was really loud. I didn't think it was that nice to look at. That's a personal thing. And originally I liked the hopper and I was using the hopper for a long time. I used to be more of a hopper person, but I've switched to single dose. Also made a video on my single dosing, little do it yourself, bean seller. I got used to the single dose flow and actually was using single dose on my Sete 270. I would just fill it in the hopper every morning. When I saw the Weber workshop, they were promising a lot of things that interested me. So there was the low retention, although not really an issue I had on my Sete 270, this magnetic magic tumbler, the integrated RDT, beautiful design, full metal. This thing is heavy. You have to hold it with two hands and I'm very scared to move it and drop it. And there was a couple of other things that really, really interested me in being able to push my coffee experience a little bit further, given where I'm at right now. And I figured that this would allow me to get there. Let's cover general specs. And then we are going to get into the nitty gritty of each of these things. Design and longevity. It's made with so much metal. I don't even know if there's any plastic parts on this thing. It's super well built. It's built like a tank. This thing is nine kilograms, which is about 20 pounds. It is heavy. It is so heavy. I think it's like four times the weight of my Sete 270. But when you look at it, you can tell it's built quality and it's not gonna move. <laughs> this thing is gonna stay on your counter. There's a little bit of a rubber edge as well along the bottom perimeter. It doesn't vibrate very much when it grinds anyway. You're pretty much gonna set this on your counter. You're not gonna bring this around. There's this beautiful hardwood landing pad. There's a little bit of wood detailing here as well. I'm not sure what kind of wood it is. Some people complained about the yellowness. I don't know if that's maybe from what they're seeing on photos, uh, but I find it works really well with this color. This is the snow, which is a matte white. They also have one called onyx, which is a black. And I actually originally wanted the onyx just because of the way it looked. I thought that the black with the wood was so much more beautiful than the white. But in my kitchen, it's all white. It just kind of made sense. I didn't want it to stand out too much. I want it to stand out because it's beautiful, but I didn't want it to stand out overly in my kitchen when everything else is white and silver. Let me know in the comments below. In my kitchen, you think that the snow or the onyx is nicer or which one you would like. On the onyx black version, this is black as well with white etching, I think, or silver etching maybe on the, on the text because it's not painted, it's etched. And 
it just looks so much more uniform and so much more beautiful. And the black with the wood is super classic looking. Apparently they couldn't paint this white because of some sort of procedure or something. I can't really exactly remember the details, but there was some sort of technical reason for that. I thought it would bother me this like matte, I don't know, stainless steel, I guess. I got used to it, it's not that big of a deal. And it matches my Moulin grinders from Weber Workshops as well. I heard one of the other reviewers talk about how this is dirty. And if you're somebody that doesn't like to clean up, then you're gonna wanna get the black one. I haven't found that to be a huge issue for me. Like, yes, you might see a couple of coffee grains there. The brush is always there. It's so easy to knock off. And if your hands are a little bit dirty and then you touch the grinder for some reason, which I don't really see why you would, then yes, of course you'll get it a bit dirty, but you can just take a damp cloth and clean it off. It comes off, no problem. It has this connector C13 plug in the back. So it can actually be used in different parts of the world. They just ship you a different cord. Or if you move, you could also get a different cord. The input voltage is 90 to 240 volts. It is small, tiny footprint with this 83 millimeter massive Mazer tin coated burrs. As you can tell, really, really small. So you could fit this easily on your bar. Fitting an 83 millimeter Mazer burr, a giant Mazer burr into a small footprint. And I believe that they accomplished that very well. Supposed to be virtual zero retention. There's a integrated WD T-tool right here. They give you two spares as well extra. You need to install this when you first get it. It's very easy to install. There's the magic magnetic tumbler. There's also a magnet on the base as you just saw as well as on the top. The base one is for the standard tumbler. This is the magic tumbler. I didn't get the standard tumbler. If you were to get that one, it locks into place in a very satisfactory manner. You also have adjustable RPM knob on the side that goes from 30 to 150. Originally I'm 50 to 300, but it was modifying down. But 150 is plenty enough. Then there's the little button on the side with an LED. You have a integrated brush right here, which is really cool. This is a bore brush, but they do have an option for synthetic for ethical or religious reasons if you wanted that one. They also threw in this little tiny dosing cup as well as this beautiful amber bottle, glass bottle RDT spray. The mist that comes out of this, super, super tiny fine particles. It's great. I really like this missing bottle. I almost want to like use it for my face. This magic tumbler fits in 58 millimeter portafilter. The standard tumbler that has the funnel and then the tumbler on the bottom fits either a 49 or a 58 millimeter portafilter. I believe it has two different notches. So the same one could fit on both. I'm not sure if it's a one or two year warranty from delivery anymore because the Indiegogo had two different informations on it. So I'm not 100% sure on that, but I would assume it's probably the one year. And it is a stepped, not stepless, adjustment. I'll get into that later. It's supposed to be able to grind finer than Turkish coffee and go all the way to French press. So you have a wide variety of coffee options. Although I will be mainly reviewing espresso for the time being, because that's what I've been using it for, for the last month. The birds are supposed to be aligned straight out of the box. I got this on the Indiegogo campaign. I paid $14.99 USD. It is going to be sold original price at 2000 USD. I had to pay DHL freight shipping at 130 USD. And then I paid just under 300 in duties and taxes plus conversion came to about 2,500 Canadian dollars. That's a lot of money. Yes, that's a lot of money. I don't know what I was thinking. So if you're in Canada and you want to get this at the regular price of pre-order, the duties and taxes are just going to come to a little bit more because the base cost of it will go up a little bit as well. So just things to keep in mind, but it gives you a good ballpark figure. And it arrived pretty quick. It took, I think like two weeks or something to arrive. Those are the general specs. So bold in design, love it. It's beautiful. I think it looks great. Very industrial looking. It's a Weber workshop-esque. Douglas, the creator, did work for Apple. So he's definitely got that aesthetic and that whole eye for design and has considered a lot of things. Now, do all those things work as well as they say? More or less. It is a single dose, as you can see. This popcorn lid, this was definitely something that was added after the fact. There's little rubber coatings at the edge here to just keep it in place, but you can move it. It's loose. Uh, some people seem pretty bothered with it. I'm not that bothered with it. However, for its functionality of popcorning, does it help 100%? Not quite. Once in a while, you will get bits that will fly out. I haven't found it that annoying because it's once in a while in some bits. I have heard other people complain quite a bit. This is something that I'm pretty sure he'll be able to revise anyway, and you could buy a separate piece. I'm sure there's going to be mods for it. I've seen people actually use the single dose and then put this to kind of cover that up. I guess that could work as some sort of solution. I personally don't like it. 
I might find something to cover here, but it hasn't been significant enough of an issue for me that I have looked into it, but that might be something I will do in the future. Then you have this piece right here. This is also movable. I'm assuming it's so it makes it easier to clean the birds from the top if you wanted to. Also, what I did find useful for this is if I RDT'd, sometimes the beans would stick a little bit to this bowl and I can either take out the lid or just run my hand through it or I can just kind of give it a shake like that. So I don't know if that was the purpose, but if you've been lurking on the forums, you might see that some people have had some finish issues. I am actually one of those people, but it's such a minor one and I was also one of the first people to get the unit. And I'm bringing this up because you're going to see it mentioned on forums. In certain angles, you'll see it it's being rectified. I've seen other people worried about the burr alignment. Weber Workshops has posted on their Instagram showing the QC that they follow with this before shipping all of them. They check for up to 30 microns of run out, which I believe is the movement that goes in there. And then when it's spinning, it shouldn't really have any problems with the grind anyway and shouldn't affect the grind is what he was saying, if I understood correctly. Generally though, that they would fall in a 10 micron run out from each other. 10 microns being two times the steps. Human hair size is about 70 microns. So we're talking really minute. Whether there's a lemon here and there is another topic. I cannot say because that's not the case for me. I'm not saying it's possible. I'm not saying it's impossible. You know, this is kind of the thing when you're an early adopter. If a product is new, there's going to be some kinks to iron out. The creator is not in Taiwan and I believe Taiwan borders are really strict. So all the approval is being done by probably digitally and probably by physical samples. So if somebody in the factory is not really doing their job or the supervision has gone a little bit down, the QC has gone a little bit down, and even if you put very strict QC things in place. So I think those things can happen, but I believe that they're going to be ironed out by the time people get their pre-ordered ones at the full price. I'm bringing that up because you're going to see that on forums if you're lurking around, but I don't think that's going to be a huge issue because his reputation's on the line. And from what I've seen, he's quite the perfectionist. I have had good experience with the Weber Workshops customer service. I've had to be a little bit more careful with my messages just because I felt there was a little bit of defensiveness that I had to factor in. I will say, however, that I believe that they're at a point now that I feel that customer service could be better handled if they had a bigger team that can handle that just so there's some separation between the creator and the product. From what I've seen, it's less people than more people that are having issues. A lot of people that are not having issues aren't necessarily going on forums to talk about how ecstatic they are, that their unit has nothing and is working and looking how it's supposed to. <laughs> it's just kind of how humans are, right? We focus on the negatives more than we do on the positives. So just a little little parentheses there. One of the things that Douglas was mentioning in the Indiegogo is his focus on packaging and having a lower environmental impact. And I'm surprised that nobody actually talked about this. The packaging is made in a way that it fits the key really well. It uses mostly cardboard, which is easily recyclable, very little plastic and foam in there. There's a little plastic bag with the instructions. If somebody purchases a leather tap, it could be put in there. This one same packaging is used for Weber Key and can also accommodate the optional leather tamp and can accommodate the optional bean seller all in the same packaging. So it's made in a brilliant way and I need to highlight that because the environmental impacts is something that a lot of companies, in my opinion, should be thinking about. There was a lot of design and thought considerations in the packaging as well. Cleaning out the birds is really easy. I would suggest you lay it flat on its side if you're gonna clean it out, though you could do it like this. If you do undo the little screw underneath here, just put a towel, put your hand here to make sure to hold it so it doesn't fall and go onto your landing pad. If this cracks, I think you'll be very sad. It's glued on, so it wouldn't be very easy to fix or repair. So do keep that in mind. I've taken it out twice to clean now. It's been very easy to clean and put it back. Whatever number it was set at created that gap in between your two burrs to create that grind setting. So I believe that once you put it back, it's the same. I can't say for sure just because I played with my numbers so many times that I wasn't paying attention to that. But when I was chatting with someone on the forum, they said that, that they got the same numbers with the same coffee after cleaning out the burrs. So I would say based on that, it would be true, but I have to test it out for myself the next time I clean out the burrs. There's some great design details. And I like that the brush is always there. It's a little bit of a hard brush. Some of the hairs are a little bit kinked, but what I do really like with this is that it's kind of like a little lipstick. Boop. 
and you can close it. But what's really great is that when you push it in, the metal piece that I just popped up, that sleeve, there's something in there that pushes it back so that once you're ready to use it, you just have to pull it out. So it doesn't come out like this and you have to pull it back down again. That's a really small design detail, but it's such a good one because that just helps you in your workflow and user experience. And I haven't seen anyone else really mention that, but that's a detail I definitely picked up on. Let's talk about the Magic Tumbler next. I really like this. A little tip is I found it was easier to just give it a quick twist to dislodge the magnets and then pull out. In practice, how well does this work? A mess-free workflow, like they say. You have to be a little bit more careful with this. When it's closed and it's like this, no mess, of course no mess. But if you are not careful and you don't do the little twist, it's not gonna be very difficult for you to get used to that in your workflow. But I remember one of the times I pulled it down, this little piece that's in here, it knocked it a little bit, that just a little bit of a gap and then the coffee just came out in the bottom and that kind of made a little bit of a mess. So definitely a big tip is to do a little twist to dislodge it and then it comes out really easily. But you have to be careful not to knock this wiper. First of all, you don't wanna bend it, but you do get two extra ones because there's a little bit of a, coffee's on there and then you'll see here that it'll just make a little bit of a mess which it already kind of did here so in the magic tumbler you have this little stopper in the middle they call this little stopper a plug if you look at the bottom there's actually a little bit of a ridge here that it sits on top of your porta filter so when you have this on your porta filter and you take out the plug the coffee drops right down i find it works really well because it just drops down in an even way instead of let's say my sete 270 and a lot of other grinders where it falls into the porta filter and it creates a little mound from the middle like a mountain out and so you have to play with it and do w dt and everything to be able to redistribute all the grinds before tamping i don't know what other youtubers i saw complaining about that they seemed a lot more upset about it than i am i found it works quite well i don't find this works necessarily that that well as promised but i also haven't had massive issues with clumping i haven't really been doing wdt and have been having really great shots of espresso and i live right now in canada in the winter where the humidity especially in my building right now i was having issues and it's at 20 percent. it's really low humidity so static has definitely been more of an issue for me but i've actually managed to make it work quite well but i'll get into that in the rpm section I saw Douglas writing in some forums and he was, somebody had asked like, would there be a possible version with magnets underneath? He said that was something that he had explored, but they had tested different things out and didn't really quite work. I wouldn't be surprised to see some updates to the Magic Tumblr. Maybe they'll address some of the problems that other people have been having, but I found it worked quite well. The dosing ring is a stepped dosing ring. Some people were losing their minds about this because they're like, ah, oh, I need stepless, but it is five microns in between each step. Five microns is minute. For size reference, a human hair is actually 70 microns. While a piece of household dust can be 40 microns, white blood cells can get as small as 25 microns, red blood cells as small as five microns. So the adjustments between each of these notches is the size of a red blood cell. Five microns I think is the smallest adjustment that you can find on a stepped grinder these days. I actually prefer the stepped just because it locks into place with these little pins right here. And I found with my set day that things would move a little bit. And this ensures that nothing moves because it's locked in there. Is it easy to move things around? Yes or no. It's not as elegant as one may think. It's not like the niche where you can just take one hand and spin it like that. So generally, I would say it does, well, you can do it with one hand, but I generally just use two and I turn it. Not the end of the world. I don't think it's a huge deal. I don't find that the experience is super elegant, but it also just works. One of the things that I thought was a negative actually ended up being a benefit. So it was the fact that this can actually kind of pop right off and that you can adjust the numbers to a degree because there are certain places where it connects. There's like little ridges but I actually found that to be an advantage. Once you figure out your grind setting, in this case, let's say right now I'm playing with 14. 14 is an arbitrary number. It's relative to my grinder and where it's zeroed in on my grinder. So you can't exchange grind settings with your friend that has a key, but I'm pretty sure that applies to every single grinder. In this case, let's say I wasn't happy with the 14. I really liked where this was, but I it just psychologically, I wanted a lower number because let's say I wanted to go up by six, different little notches, then I'd be back at one. But then let's say I want to go a little bit 
coarser and I'd go down. All of a sudden I'd go from technically 15.2 to back to 14, but the 15 would actually be, you know, zero. You see what I'm saying? Let's say I was at 14. I think this is an advantage. And you wanted to have a lower number. I could just turn this all around to wherever the ridge will let me, this will get me close to zero. Actually, could I go down? I could go down even to here. There you go, look. And there we are. Now I'm at a much lower number. I think that's an advantage. I don't know if that was intentional. So at first I thought it was a bit weird because it popped off completely and I thought that was not very elegant, but this is a pretty significant advantage for me just because in my head, espresso is a slow number and I rather have a little bit easier play up and down than to go up into the double digits and play with it that way. So that was pretty cool. It's a little bit, mm, I think it shakes a little bit, it's finicky. There's nothing that blocks it up. So you can, if you're not careful, you, whoa, you lift it up. Um, mentioning that, it doesn't bother me that much. These are also etched in, I believe, which means that they're not gonna easily come off. Cute little font. They use something a little bit of an old school looking font as well for the RPM. In the instruction manual, they say, be very sure that the locking ring is locked like this. So the pins are all down. It's nice and locked and it's secured before you operate the grinder. Going coarser is a lot easier because you know, you're creating more of a gap. So that's less of an issue. Going finer, go, smaller number until you feel resistance, then lock, then turn on the grinder to loosen any particles in there and then do that. You might have to do it once or twice depending, you know, if you're going from pour over to espresso, let's say. Be very careful that it is locked when you do operate the grinder. And this is important because I believe that the rotation of this stem as well as the direction of the burrs are like in the same directions. If this is up and you're turning things and then you operate it, it can actually grab the burr and then it could seize. All right, let's talk about the massive burrs in here. This giant thing right here. 83 millimeter Mazer. I think you're gonna be so tired of me saying that. 83 millimeter Mazer tin coated burrs. So there's a couple of things to talk about the burrs. Pretty much the largest burrs that you can get on the market. They're usually made for commercial settings, but you have it in a home setting. Is that overkill? Probably probably to be honest. One of the big advantages of a large burr is use the grinder a lot and not have a lot of heat distribute onto your beans that you're grinding. Is that gonna happen in a home setting? It's, it's unlikely. It's not like you're making 20 shots back to back. Other information I found online about bigger burrs is that it generally has less noise, more power, and that a bigger burr increased cutting surfaces which makes a more uniform grind. It's supposed to come pre-season right out of the box. I found it worked really well, but once again, not a coffee expert, and I'm coming from the Sete to Stephanie, which is a completely different class of product. They have it pre-seasoned and they have their own proprietary way. They're not actually wasting coffee. They have something else that they run through it. The equivalent of hundred kilograms of coffee through it to just get rid of any little inconsistencies in the burrs, maybe some, you know, a couple like straddler pieces or whatever. Then they apply the tin coating on top of it. And the tin coating is supposed to help protect the edges of the burr and also make it last a lot longer. The coating is also supposed to help with corrosion. I don't really know how much of an issue that is in grinders, but I guess if you do RDT, the Ross droplet technique, so water on your beans, maybe that could help with that. So there's a couple of added benefits to having this tin coating on it. How long will the burrs last? probably will outlive you. So the information I found, I believe is on Weber Workshops page or something somewhere, said that these burrs would be rated for 4,000 kilograms of coffee. Now a standard bag of coffee is about 340 grams. 4,000 kilograms divided by 340 grams, that is 11,764.7 bags of coffee. And each bag blasts me personally about, I don't know, two, two and a half weeks. So all in all, with that calculation, that's about 20.8 bags in a year. That would mean that the burrs would last theoretically, 565.6 years. I don't even know if humanity will exist by then. So the aliens are gonna have to find us and figure out what the heck this is. Good luck. Humans are weird, we like our coffee. So this is a conical burr. 
I don't want to get too much in the details of conical versus flat burrs. There's just so much information to take in from that and also learn from what I've read. As a rule of thumb, a flat burr is a little bit less forgiving for dialing in. You got to get it like real exact. And actually that's the experience that my friend said he had with his Eureka Mignon Specialista. Although I don't think he has played with another grinder and he has a flat burr, but it has clearer shots. And this is a conical. And generally the rule of thumb with the conical is that it's a little bit easier to dial in and it has what they call bimodal particle distribution. It's a fancy way to just say that there's a bit more fines in there versus a unimodal flapper. Flapper also has a little bit more retention, generally speaking. Lots of companies are trying to find ways to change that these days. And uh, each one has an advantage. Each one has different things. Uh, a conical burr is a little bit more on the texture body side versus a flat burr that's a little bit more on the clarity side, but a little bit less body and texture. If you're gonna get more clarity, you're gonna get less body and vice versa. Depends on what you like, what kind of thing you drink. If you're drinking something with a little bit more fruit flavored, like Ethiopian naturals and washed and stuff like that, you might wanna go for something more flat burr. And if you're going for something more classic espresso flavor with nutty and chocolatey flavors, and you kind of want more of that texture, well, you would likely go with a conical burr. Now keep in mind that there's a lot of other factors to consider. Grinders are getting very complex these days, so you can't really take just conical versus flat anymore, I would say. I mean, I think those general rules of thumb apply, but then there's also the geometry of the actual burr and what the creator of the grinder was trying to go, what type of particles it's creating with that geometry, et cetera, et cetera, and what flavor profile it'll get. It's um, complicated, <laughs> is what it is. Things that I've read about, if there's more popcorning and create more variances and more particle finds, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just a lot of things to factor in. So it's really just what your taste buds are saying. I think that once you start getting into that rabbit hole, it can get a little intense. I don't know how much I can tell of a difference uh, but I also haven't played with that many grinders. I played with two. I'm gonna link a podcast down below that's really interesting to listen to that features Douglas. And he talks a little bit about this grinder and conical versus flat and a bunch of other really interesting things. So I think you should check that out. All right, let's get into the flavor profile. According to James Hoffman with the HG2, which is the manual version of the key, he was saying that less body than niche, a little bit more clarity, which makes sense since, like I said, they're kind of on this seesaw. They're relative to each other. I don't think you can get something with a lot of body and a lot of clarity. They kind of, it's one or the other, you know? A little bit of sweet, more sweetness as well. It sits in between the niche and a good flat burr, according to James Hoffman. What I've seen other people say, and I believe that this is my experience, although I don't have experience with flat burrs, is it gives you a lot of the benefits of conical with being able to dial in easily with a little bit more of a flavor of flat burr. And actually, coming from the Sete 270, which is a 40 millimeter conical hardened steel burr to the 83 millimeter Mazur tin coated burrs, I have noticed actually a difference. And I drink my coffees, oh my God, you're gonna get so upset. There's gonna be some purists that are gonna get really upset, but I don't care. This is how I drink my coffee. A couple of squirts of my maple syrup, a amber maple syrup, so very light flavored maple syrup, not a very strong, rich flavor, just so it could bring out the sweetness in the coffee, but it doesn't overpower the coffee with the flavor of maple syrup. I'm Canadian, I take my maple syrup very seriously. So we have different options for maple syrup. And, then I like to froth about four ounces of milk and make a nice flat white with a double shot ristretto. That is generally how I like my coffee. And even with all of that, I haven't drank it pure because I just, I can't, I don't enjoy it. I'm not there. Don't know if I ever will be and I'm okay with that. But even with the flat white with the key versus the flat white with the Sete 270, I did notice a difference. I did notice that there was more clarity and the fruit flavor, the whiny flavors of my Ethiopian naturals were popping out a lot nicer on the key than my Sete 270. And that was a pleasant surprise because I do like that. And I was considering a flat burr at some point. Then I got this and I went, oh, and then I found out more about conicals and flat. Then I thought I had buyer's remorse. Actually, this brings it out really nicely. I don't know how much more a flat burr would bring it out, but I'm really happy with that. I also noticed less texture, which less mouthfeel, less body. And that was a little bit weird for me at first. And yes, even with the milk, the microfoamed milk, I was able to tell that. So 
I don't know how it would be just on an individual level of espresso, just the espresso shots, but I did notice more clarity and less body with this compared to my Sete 270. I was really surprised that I was able to tell that difference because I didn't think, first of all, that I was there in my coffee experience, and second of all, that with all the milk and sugar that I would be able to gauge that, but it was significant enough that I was able to tell. I feel like the shots that I've been getting to are just like so much more smooth and tasty. I've also been playing with my Breville dual boiler though to do long manual pre-infusion. So right out of the box, BDB unmodded. That is a video that I will be doing as well. So stay tuned for that. Look in the description. It might already be there. With that long manual pre-infusion and the key, I have been getting the tastiest shots, including a washed, I think it was a pen, Panama Katui, one of the roasters I visited gave me in the summer and I froze some of it. I don't remember all the param parameters before that I had or the flavor notes that I wrote down, but I do remember not being that impressed with it. And then I just put it away and I was gonna wait till I got my Arco hand grinder to, to make some pour overs with it. But then when I got the key, I decided to defrost it, put it in my fridge and then let it thaw, then use it the next day. And the flavors I was getting out of that was so fruit forward. So that is one thing that I will say with certainty with my own experience is that it's definitely bring, bringing out a lot more clarity than my Sete 270 conical burrs. This has been really interesting and I'm very happy with the flavor that I'm getting out of it. All right, lastly, one of the big selling features of this as well is the adjustable RPM from 30 to 150. So 30, 50, 70, 90, 110, 130, 150. That's a really fun thing. That's something that's different and new with this grinder and with the industry people trying to figure things out. The EG1 from Weber also has an adjustable RPM. I don't believe many other grinders have that. The theory of that is that the higher the RPM, the more fines that you're gonna get. So you could tweak it to have a little bit more body. Now, in my experience, I haven't noticed that significant difference. For me, the differences in the flavors were pretty similar between the higher and lower RPM. My building is having humidity issues, clearly, because it's way too low. It's at 20% according to two different machines that I have reading the humidity. Yes, because I am that person that I have these little machines at home. What I have noticed is that at a lower RPM, a lot less issues with static. Without any RDT at 30 RPM, I wasn't having any static or very, very little that like if I were to just knock the magic tumbler and have the grinds fall in, there would be no clumping. So it would fall in pretty nicely and then I can just even things out. But at 30 RPM with light roasts, I did encounter issues of a semi stalling. And I saw Douglas responded on somebody else's review about that. He says, the low RPM stalling with the light roast is a brushless motor will inherently have less torque at lower RPMs and the grinder should be able to grind any drinkable coffee at the grind size from the mid-range RPM. So the stalling is actually a protection mechanism so the motor doesn't burn out. Their way of ensuring that it will last decades and they could uh, limit the lower end of the RPM but that would mean that medium roasts and pour overs won't be able to explore the super slow grind profiles that we find interesting on unexplored territories. We think it makes a more powerful as a tool, even if it requires a little bit more gas to grind through harder beans. It seemed like the other people were more upset about it than I was. I found putting it at 40 RPM didn't have that semi-stall issue. By the way, when it's semi-stalled, it still does grind. It just kind of gets stuck for a second because it's like trying to push through that. And I guess that protection mechanism that Douglas was mentioning. The original RPMs were 50 to 300. They ended up lowering that range. I prefer having that wider range, but just knowing the limitations of the machine. And in my case, for light, dense Ethiopian roasts, I just boost it to 40. One of the big differences too, however, with the low RPM and the higher RPM is noise. It's obviously going to be louder and faster at 150 and it's going to be quieter and slower at the lower rpm with the 30 rpm with 20 grams it was taking me like a minute 46 and then at 150 rpm it was taking me something like 16 seconds to grind a 20 gram dose so there's a lot of things that you can play with rpm so some people are playing with it for flavor texture clarity body all that stuff having more body at the higher rpm not something i personally noticed i'm playing with the rpms 
mainly based on static. I'm looking forward to the coming months when it gets warmer. I'm just looking forward to that in general. I'm looking forward to testing that out when there's gonna be generally more humidity in the air. See if I can go higher with the RPM and not have to use any RDT and not have any static issues. So that'll be interesting to see. I found with the dry beans, if I went to let's say 150 or even 70, 90, it would get stuck on the sides and then I'd have to really give it a hard tap because they were static together, they would pop up in clumps. And so then you would require a second WDT tool, like the actual needles. That happened once or twice and I just lowered the RPM or had it at a higher RPM, but did RDT with the spray bottle that's included. So there are different options like that. I like that I have the flexibility to play around with this. This is definitely something I'm gonna be playing around with a lot more. By the way, if you're really like geeky like this, there's a lot of people on the Home Barista forum that are talking about this. Weber Workshop also has their own separate forum. It's not that busy as of yet, but it would be cool if it gets busier. Douglas sometimes pops in there to chime in. So that's pretty cool that you can have a more direct rapport with him. He'll, he'll lurk on there. So any comments or feedback, he'll probably be taking into consideration, at least I hope. In the conclusion, was this worth it? I went from the most budget espresso grinder you can get to something very premium and high end and just like so overkill for where I'm at in my espresso journey. Do I have any buyer's remorse or regret? No, actually. There's so many things to explore with this. I love a lot of the design touches. Does it promise that well on the Magic Tumbler and the Mess Free? No. Does the WDT tool work that well? Not as well as promised, but it does work well enough in my case. I'm not having huge issues now that I figured out the RPM, static, everything. Not having any issues with clumping. I'm able to take the plug out, have all the coffee fall down really well. Tap the bed on the, my portafilter and tamp. And I don't do any extra steps. So it has improved my workflow. It's changed my workflow actually too. My workflow is quite different from my Sete 270. And that will be a separate video because video review is gonna be 40 minutes long otherwise. I have found the workflow overall simpler and then the integrated brush does make cleaning easier. Having my little tabletop vacuum makes it a lot easier to clean. I don't know why I didn't get something like this sooner to be honest. Overall, I'm very happy with it. I feel like at this price point, there's a lot of expectations and I think it does live up to a lot of its expectations. It's not perfect. There's a couple of things. There's some things you have to get used to. Sometimes when I'm really careful, no mess will come out. So there is a little bit of a delicateness to this in some ways, even despite its very industrial look in how you handle it in order to make it mess free, clump free, all of that. But I feel like there's a lot of things that it does remove in my workflow and energy and it does open up a wider range for me. For the most part, I found the grinder very satisfactory for what I was originally promised. Maybe people's expectations were a little, set a little higher. Maybe the campaign oversold the expectations in some people's minds and it didn't live up to the expectation that they had anticipated or understood from the campaign. Having used this for a month now, I'm satisfied. I don't think a perfect grinder exists. You're gonna find people that complain about something somewhere. If they make any improvements to the Magic Tumbler, I may purchase you in the future, depending on what the modifications are. I hope there is a updated popcorn lid. It hasn't upset me enough that it's something that I would harp on. I like the cups that it's making. With the key grinder and my long manual pre-infusion on the BDB with light roasts, I've had the most cups that I've gone, whoa. Like I've actually audibly would go, whoa, this is really good. And I will eventually explore pour over with this as well. Is it worth $2,500 Canadian plus more? That's a hard one to say. Would I have done this all over again? I think so. A lot of the money is spent on the engineering, the R&D and all of this crazy metal, this nine kilograms of metal. Whether you believe that's a worthwhile way to spend your money or not is up to you. I really like things like this because it's something that I interact and play with on a daily basis. And so these touches make a huge difference to me. It just makes my coffee experience even more refined. I appreciate these things, some other people might not. So if that's not something that you prioritize, then obviously it's not the grinder for you. But if you really like the quality build and something that's, I guess, even heirloom, it's great. Is this gonna be my end game grinder? Maybe, actually, maybe. I haven't played with flat burrs. 
I think maybe for my sanity and wallet, I shouldn't. And let me know in the comments below if you would pay this much for this grinder. If you have one on order, if you have one, have how your experiences have been. Are they in line with mine? Are you happy with your grinder? Do you regret it? Do you like it? Do you feel it was worth it? Let me know all your thoughts down below. Like this if it has provided you any value, some entertainment that would really be appreciated. It would help feed the algorithm. Subscribe if you haven't already. Click the bell notification. Share this video with your coffee friends. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.